first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak on this lecture series. And uh, thank you all for signing up and joining in on a Friday afternoon. Um, as my talk suggests, I'm here to talk about Loki and small angle neutron scattering. Um, to begin with, as it's an instrument talk, uh, just to quickly give a little background on the theory itself. So I'm just going to find my slides. Give me two seconds. And there we go. Uh, hopefully you're seeing the right slide there now. So my big interest is small angle neutron scattering. But as I hope most people know, small angle scattering theory is pretty similar um, across the different X-ray neutrons and lights. It's an experimental technique which uses elastic scattering at small angles to investigate the structure of substances at the mesoscopic scale from one nanometer to a couple of hundred nanometers. We have our probe, as I said, X-ray, neutrons, light. It's fired towards our sample. Our sample has different scattering centers which scatter the probe and it's detected at a detector. What are we interested in? Well, we're interested in the amount of scatter and our scattering vector. What's our scattering vector? So if we can consider, consider rather, um, the scattering geometry and Bragg's law. So here, if we look on the right-hand side of our figure, we have our instant beam hitting our sample. It's scattered off at an angle theta, and it's checked by the detector. And we look at Bragg's law, Bragg's law where we have our wavelength, which is equal to 2D, the distance sine theta over 2. We can switch this to reciprocal phase, space using the relationship Q equals 2 pi over D, where Q is our wave vector, and we get this equation here. What's important to note is our Q, our wave vector is dependent on the wavelength and the scattering angle. What's interesting with small angle neutron scattering is there's two ways of going about acquiring this Q vector or understanding this Q vector information. We can use continuous SANS or kind of referring to as continuous SANS. This is whereby we have a fixed wavelength. So we keep this wavelength constant and essentially we're measuring different thetas to determine this Q. This is our kind of our space range. Um, so we have our fixed wavelength and we measure varying different thetas across our detector distance. We need, bearing in mind though, you're limited by the amount of thetas across the detector distance. So to get at like an adequate Q range, we need several measurements of different detector distances to cover an adequate Q range. These type of experiments are typically performed in reactor sources with the exceptions of time of flight instruments that can operate in monochromatic mode. The other way of measuring SANS is in time of flight. Um, uh, this, in this scenario, we use a wavelength band instead of just a monochromatic beam. So instead of using a, like a 10% resolution 5 Armstrong beam, we might use a wavelength band between, I don't know, say 2 and 10 Armstrongs. It's referred to as time of flight because the relationship between the time it takes a neutron to get from, say, its source to the detector is obviously directly proportional to the wavelength of that neutron. So that's how, by coordinating the times, so we can work out the wavelength that's involved. In this scenario, we have obviously a varying lambda, but we also have the kind of, I say varying, the difference in uh, feeter as we go across the detector. Using this method, we can access a large dynamic Q range at just one detector distance. Um, these experiments are typically performed on spallation sources. Again, there's a couple of, of exceptions, such as the ILL D33 instrument and the ANSTO Bilby instrument. So I am going to be talking about a time of flight instrument. Uh, I'm kind of going to focus on this a little bit more just to push the point home. Imagine, so this figure here is our um, 2D reduced pattern, right? So we have Q uh, QX and QY uh, as our axes. Imagine we have a fixed wavelength beam of 6.25 Armstrongs. This is the figure that we get of reduced data. If we include some shorter wavelengths, I think going down to four Armstrongs, we increase our Q max and we access some more of our, our distance, our, our space. We use even shorter wavelengths again, we expand this Q max even further. And if we use our entire simultaneous wavelength range, we can access from 1.75 to six, using, sorry, 1.75 to 16.5 in this example, Pretty sure this was performed on SANS 2D. It gives an incredibly wide simultaneous Q range with just one detector distance. If you can imagine for comparison, this kind of detect this kind of Q range might need two or three different detector distances at a reactor continuous source. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, what's important to note is obviously there's advantages and disadvantages to both techniques. Continuous sources are typically higher flux, so you can perform obviously faster measurements. But one of the huge advantages with time of flight is the fact that you can do this in a single shot. For example, if you have a sample which you're monitoring that changes over time, 
by measuring a time of flight source, you can gather all your Q range in one go. At a time of flight at a continuous source, you might have to repeat the experiment at the different detector distances. There's more involved in terms of fluxes and resolutions and whatnot. Um, but yeah. So now we've understood we can gather a Q vector. This is our x-axis, this is our inverse space, where small Q is big sizes, um, high Q is small sizes. Uh, we can reduce our 2D data. So this is essentially understanding how this intensity relates to the, so this is our experimental intensity. So we now have our experimental intensity versus our Q. We get these scattering profiles. From understanding these scattering profiles, uh, for example, we know they consist of these components, uh, we can determine information about the shapes and structures of our samples, whether that be the shape, where the form factor, the P of Q, or the structure factor, how the particles interact, the S of Q. One of the important things that we can play with, of course, is our difference in scattering length density. And that's one of the, of course, the magics of, magic of neutrons, which allows us to uh, really tune and probe our samples. So just a quick recap and what I mean by that. Of course, contrast matching. So the generic example that everyone gives, if you consider that each component or molecular formula and um, density of your system has a different scattering length density value or a scattering length density. So for example, you have a core shell particle where the core is different to the shell, which is different to the solvent. They each have different scattering length densities. What we can do though, using selective due duration, is tune the scattering length density of, for example, the solvent to match a different component in our system. So for example, in the middle, we can match the solvent scattering length density to that of the shell, thus to neutrons, only the core is visible. In contrast, or in contrast, in addition, for example, in solvent free, we can tune the scattering length density of our solvent. And by tune, I mean, for example, mixing D2O and H2O, uh, we can match the scattering length density to the core and thus only see the shell. This allows us to investigate selective parts of complex assemblies, uh, of course using selective due duration. Furthermore, by combining x-rays and neutron measurements, we can get even more information. So, one quick example uh, is, for example, microgels in a crowded environment. Hereby we have a mixture of hydrogenated and deuterated particles. If we look in the sample, all of them are visible. We can study them with x-rays. This was a kind of a crystalline type sample. So we get our intensity is built up of a mixture of our form factor, which is of course the shape of our, our particles, and the structure factor, the interactions. As it was quite crystalline, we can start to see these uh, sharp peaks developing. And now if we look at it with neutrons, and we uh, select a solvent that matches the scattering length density of these deuterated particles. So instead of hydrogen, we have deuter uh, deuterium. Now, whenever we look at it with neutrons, we should only see that of the hydrogenated particles. So thereby we'll only see the shape of these hydrogenated particles and no longer see the interactions between these densely packed deuterated and hydrogenated particles. So here by example, with SANS we see the I of Q, which is uh, directly related to the form factor. These were scattering profiles of the exact same samples, but you can see the benefits of the different information that you can garner uh, depending on how you deuterate and uh, perform your experiments. So hopefully, I've kind of <laughs> given a brief overview, uh, which I think uh, some people know about the power of neutrons, but of course, we need these in the first place. So where do our neutrons come from? Uh, as you may know, the first neutron source, or slash rather the first neutron, was discovered by James Chadwick in 1932, uh, later followed about six years later by the discovery of nuclear fission. Nuclear fission is whereby a neutron hits a metastable nucleus, it splits into a fission product, a fission product rather, and more neutrons, of which some of them can go around and hit other, uh, for example, uranium nucleuses, starting a chain reaction and thus the, uh, the system or the whatever goes critical. This was followed about 30 years later with the beginning of the spallation source. Uh, in this, uh, in this uh, method, protons, so a high-powered proton beam, are fired towards a nucleus. The nucleus becomes excited, it then decays and emits gammas, neutrons and protons. And obviously it's the neutrons that, for my purpose, we're we're garnering. I should say also that these proton beams are, are fired in pulses towards the neutrons, so uh, towards the heavy, um, towards the nucleus, so they're also emitted in pulses as well. One of the benefits of this technique is that when you stop the proton source, you stop the process. There's no chain reaction in comparison to um, a continuous source reactor. 
So just a really quick overview of the evolution of these sources. Uh, point out on the left hand side we have the thermal flux given on a logarithmic scale, starting with the humble one neutron uh, by Chadwick in 1932. And then obviously from uh, the early 1940s we had the development of the steady state sources. For, uh, from a research perspective, this hit a maximum with the ILL in the kind of the beginning of the 1970s. And then around about, or shortly after, we had the beginning of the design and building of the installation of the pulse sources. These rapidly increased in power, reaching a kind of a peak in, at the end of the 1980s with the ISIS facility uh, in the UK. And then, of course, uh, hitting a maximum again in 2010 with J Park in Japan. So J Park, I think, was around about 10 to the 17 uh, neutrons per centimeter squared per second. So what we're here to talk about. ESS is hopefully going to beat that by a minimum of tenfold um, in uh, the coming years. So very briefly, the European Solution Source. So this is where I currently work, in Lund in Sweden. This is a joint project, uh, not a joint project, this is an international project with I think 15 or 17 in-kind uh, partners uh, all across Europe. Uh, but its its main host institutions are actually between Denmark and Sweden. So the data management center is actually based in Copenhagen uh, with the facility itself based in Lund. So ESS, as I said, will be a spallation source. So we have a proton accelerator that's I think uh, half a kilometer long. Inside this proton accelerator, it will accelerate the proton beam up to I think 98% the speed of light. It will then hit a heavy tungsten target and therefore and, uh, produce the neutrons. One of the interesting things about the ESS will be its reasonably slow frequency of 14 hertz and its rather exceptionally long pulse length. So just by comparison, so what I mean by pulse length is how long we're hitting with the proton beam and the neutrons are allowed to be given out uh, before the pulse stops and you wait and then the next pulse starts. If you see, for example, here we have pulse length on the x-axis, you can see that for ISIS, TS1 and TS2, they're significantly shorter in length and of course significantly lower in brightness than what we plan for the ESS, as shown by the red line, and the same can be said for the SNS and JPARC. So just to give you a scale of perspective of the growth from intensity that we're talking about here. So ESS will run with 22, uh, has been designed to be able to take 22 instruments in the first kind of big design of the whole, um, but 15 instruments have been selected so far. Uh, you can see kind of a summary of these here in the slide. We can split them into three bigger groups, so large scale structures, diffraction and spectroscopy instruments. As we're in the SANS talk, we're focused on the large scale structures. So we have two SANS instruments, Skadi and Loki, two reflectometers, Freya and Astia, and one imaging instrument, uh, Odin. So here's just a quick top view of the instrument hull. Imagine that our uh, no, neutrons, uh, sorry, our proton beam is coming from the right hand side. A couple of things to draw your attention to. One, which is uh, pretty nice to see, all the different flags from all the different in-kind partners that are contributing to each particular instrument. Uh, and also draw attention to kind of the varying lengths of the hulls. I always like to see this and draw attention to the fact that these instruments are going up, I think, to around about 160 meters in length in comparison to Loki and Freya, who rather in kind of a sacrifice to resolution, but a massive gain in flux, so much shorter instruments, uh, Loki going up to about 30 meters. So having said that, uh, I'm now going to delve a little bit closer into Loki. In the interest of honesty, uh, I should point out that this, of course, wasn't designed by me, but more Andrew Jackson, Kelly Kanaki at the ESS, uh, and Richard Heenan at ISIS. I, as I said, I took it over a couple of years ago. Well, not took it over. I joined the project a couple of years ago, um, but this is definitely uh, their baby. So first of all, just a quick update on where we are now. Of course, we've got an instrument. We've been undergoing uh, initial designs, final designs, and we're currently undergoing the pre-build stage at ISIS. What's essentially happening is the instrument is being built to the most part at ISIS. It's then in typical, in a stereotypical Swedish fashion, being flat packed and posted back to Sweden, where it will be assembled rather rapidly in the ESS instrument halls. And then, of course, undergo our beam testing and commissioning, beginning our early science, and then moving towards operations and our user operation in hopefully by uh, 2023. Okay, so what is Logi? 15 minutes in or there. 
So Loki is, of course, a SANS instrument for soft matter materials and bioscience. There's a couple of different uh, requirements there for we would like to be able to perform microfluidic SANS, so experiments with high throughput, tailored flow geometry, be able to measure biological samples. These are typically weak scatters, um, dilute solutions. Rio SANS, where we want a wide simultaneous Q range, and of course, non-equilibrium studies, uh, which happen fast, and we want to uh, do everything and like, potentially have the ability to run on sub-second timescales. So we need high flux, wide simultaneous Q range, and a flexible sample environment. So the design. What do we need? So of course we need a bright source that obviously, uh, sorry, rubber has a cold moderator to give us the white range of uh, neutrons, uh, energy range of neutrons, which we have that from the ESS and the moderator. So we're good there, we can take that off. We need a guide to transport the neutrons down to our sample position. We need choppers to shape and define our neutron profile. We need collimation drawers to shape the size um, and divergence of our beam, environments to support our samples, efficient detectors with good resolution and wide coverage to measure the scattering, and of course other considerations to include our vacuum. We don't want any paras we want to minimize parasitic air scattering or transport the maximum flux. We need shielding both for neutrons getting in and neutral or gamma rubber as well, getting in and getting out. And we need speedy electronics and state-of-the-art software. So start it all off right at the very beginning, before you kind of get down to the bare knuckles of the engineering and the building of the instrument. Uh, first of all, there's a design period by typically the instrument scientist. In order to do this, and in order to do this efficiently, there are a couple of uh, neutron simulation packages out there, one of which being the MixStas uh, program that's been developed, I think, as a, also as a, a Danish country, um, product, project rubber, and in this, uh, in the software we can put in things like the, kind of the guides, how the substrates are developed, where we have monitors, the size of apertures, the bending radius of different components of the instruments. Essentially, the long and the short of it is this gives you information about the flux that you can get, uh, positions along your samples, the divergence of your beam profiles, the, the shape of the neutrons, the energy levels of the neutrons that are being carried through the instrument. It's a lot of waffle to say that this is kind of the first stage of the design, uh, of optimizing their design for the instrument. Then once you have this, this is when you kind of move forward and you take it with the engineers and you start really designing the components. Uh, well, Robert, they do the design and you have a conversation. So the first part, I want to draw your attention to the figure in the bottom. Uh, if you can imagine our neutrons are coming from our target on the right hand side. These are being transported along the beam line through to our sample position in the middle here and then to our detectors. What we're gonna focus on is this bit on the right hand side to begin with, the area where we define our beam, right? So first of all, one of the first stages, as I mentioned, the AS comes, uh, the splitting sources or time of flight rubber uses pulses of neutrons, right? So if you can imagine from our moderator, we're gonna be getting 0.4 or from our neutron source, we're gonna be getting wavelengths of neutrons from 0.4 to 20 Armstrongs, right? There's a problem with this. So for example, if you look at this time uh, distance diagram on the right hand side, we have time on the bottom and distance along the side. This start is where our source is. If we cut our wavelength band down to say three to 10 nanometers, uh, Armstrong's rubber, and we go along our beam line, along our beam line, hit the sample position, and we go up to the detector distance, we start at our fastest uh, neutrons, say the three Armstrong ones, they'll hit the detector first. But of course, we also want to get our 10 Armstrong neutrons. They're gonna move along the beam line, boom dee dum 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 hit the sample position, and then hit the detector distance, of course, the detector rubber, a lot later. What we don't want is then when the next pulse of three to 10 Armstrongs comes along, we get an overlap at the detector between the fastest of the second pulse and the slowest of the first. We refer to this as a frame overlap, and this is what we use our choppers to try and prevent. So we chop our beam down from what? would be, say, 20 Armstrong's bandwidth, down to a bandwidth of, say, seven Armstrong's, depending on the setup of the instrument, it's just one example, uh, to prevent this from happening. Uh, we also want to use our choppers to be able to chop up our beam in order to potentially operate in a monochromatic mode. Uh, this is super useful for whenever it comes to commissioning and setting up the beam line in the first place. A couple of ways we can do that is by varying our choppers, or essentially rotating disks that have gaps in them, um, we can optimize the disk design, we can optimize the rotation speed of the disks, or we can optimize the position of these choppers along the detector. 
Now, the second methods of defining our beam is our neutron guide. We want to transport the good neutrons and remove the bad ones. Our main requirement is to transport neutrons from our moderator or source to the sample with 100% transfer, a brilliance transfer within our selective wavelength and divergence range. We also want to prevent the transport of high energy neutrons. What do I mean by this? Well, it would be really difficult to design a straight beam, uh, a straight instrument on the ESS, for example. So if you were to put just a straight line from the source straight through to the sample position, you'd have the risk of high energy neutrons that are also generated shooting right through to a sample position. One way to overcome this is by using, uh, essentially going out of line of sight. So if you can kind of vaguely get from the sketch here, we have a drop down and then a drop down again. We call these benders. And that essentially means that our sample position isn't looking straight at the source in order to avoid, essentially, so these high energy neutrons will hit big concrete walls before they hit our sample position, thus helping us to kind of reduce the background and getting the best signals and noise possible. So the third uh, kind of tool in our toolbox is our collimation. We use collimation, so sorry, one of the biggest problems or challenges rather in the design of any small angle scattering instrument is the ability to separate our direct beam from the scattered radiation at small angles. Okay, of course we want to be a small angle instrument, but if you have your direct beam that goes directly through the sample, of course, most of it is transmitted directly through and hits the detector. If you want to measure the scattering at small angle, uh, it can be kind of hard to distinguish between the two. That's why we collimate and control both the size and the divergence of the beam as much as possible. If you imagine a collimation system is essentially two pinholes, right? And then by collimating between these two pinholes, uh, by shining through these two pinholes, we get our collimated beam. Our first pinhole, however, will be one of three four drawer slit sets, essentially variable hole sizes, before the sample position at eight, five, or three meters. Then our second pinhole will be just directly before the sample position, otherwise known as a sample aperture. And again, that can be uh, variable sized. Also, in this big chamber here, we have the ability to switch between guide when we aren't using collimation and boron line tubes when we are, in order just to kind of optimize the design. I should say that the collimation is more or less identical in uh, theory to uh, every reactor source. Okay, so moving on. We now have, we should have an instrument that has the best flux in the world, or we have a facility with the best flux in the world. One of the consequences, we need a hell of a lot more shielding. So this is crucial for personal protection, to protect our users, our staff, the public from radiation. This is, of course, the highest priority. Also, by shielding, we help to improve our signal to noise ratio forever. So to do this, first of all, of course, we run simulations again to identify the amount of radiation present, how much we need to shield, where are the hot spots where we need to be particularly careful. Then we use a combination of steel and concrete caves around the entire instrument and big heavy doors in order to provide this shielding. Okay, so we've moved down to our instrument, we've uh, collimated and defined our beam and then we get to our sample position. What we wanna know of course is how best can we support our science case and take advantage of our wide simultaneous Q range and our high flux that we should have on Loki. So the plan and what we're working towards so far is of course we're going to have the off-the-shelf variety ranging from thermostated cell holders, rheometers, flow cells, etc. But also uh, in order to take full advantage we're also working towards some custom-built sample environments. For example the NERF setup, this is an, in a set a continuous flow cell that's been adapted with some in-situ spectrometries, uh, spectroscopy driver, as well as a, a densiometer along the line. This setup has actually worked out really well, and um, oh, went completely the wrong way. Uh, the Larmer beamline at Isis has actually uh, replicated the setup and uh, rather optimized it, uh, so it's currently available for users there. Alternatively, uh, we have the Flexi Probe, which is a kind of a German collaboration project. This is an easily switchable setup between in situ dynamic light scattering, or a foam cell, or humidity chambers for GSANs as shown uh, here. This setup has been prototyped and optimized at the JCNS facility in Germany. Okay, so next we've hit our samples and now of course we want to detect our neutrons. We decided to go for this novel Boron 10 via straw tube technology which is typically used in security and actually hasn't been used at, um, for uh, SANS detectors before. Love a good challenge. So 
uh, you can see kind of the layout of our detectors on the right hand side. If you imagine now that the neutrons are coming from the bottom left and hitting into the detector. Here we will, with the front banks of four panels, we can go right out to a scattering angle of 45 degrees. We then have our mid Q banks at around about four meters from the sample position. Again, these go the whole way around, 360. And finally, we have our ninth panel that can move between five and 10 meters to get access to even smaller Q. Um, a couple of things to note is one of the downfalls or slightly negative things about this technology is their efficiency isn't great. As a consequence or a way to overcome this, we stack them up. So we use loads and loads of tubes. So if you can imagine, we have four layers of aluminium tubes, so these blue tubes shown here, each containing seven boron coated straws. That's a lot. <laughs> so in total, <coughs> over the instrument, we will have 880 tubes with each with seven straws, each with 256 pixels, which will give us more than 1.5 million pixels. That is uh, a beast. So, of course, if it's a beast, there's a, this is a lot of work that we have to do to try and understand it before we get going. And obviously nothing is also ever just plug and play. We've been performing tests on the Larmor beam line at ISIS. Uh, special thanks to Rob Delgleish for allowing us to slightly hack up his instrument in order to use his detector tank with our detectors in order to minimize background scattering. Uh, this work was great. Actually, just to draw your attention to the number of cables here, this was only for, can't do quick maths here, 32 tubes, and this is how many cables we have. We have 880 tubes, so the cables are going to be fun. So what we managed to do was visualize, get this data uh, into Mantid. Uh, we managed to visualize it, start to apply some corrections uh, and kind of analyze the data. We also, of course, managed to do some first uh, reductions of the data to start to get that procedure nailed and underway. Uh, no facility is complete without its uh, data management software, its data analysis software. Uh, one thing I'd like to draw attention to is the data catalog software. For me as a user, this was particularly exciting. So this is the SciChat metadata catalog they refer to. Um, this allows users to access their information about their experimental results pretty much in real time. So as the experiment is being performed, uh, as the measurement is being run, you finish a run, your data appears on the stream kind of like appearing like a Twitter feed. All the users of that experiment and the scientists or whatever, or external people that you want have access to this data. You can also directly download the, insta the data files from it. Um, and you get a good idea about how your experiment is going or if there's a problem, all in real time. I used it once on the, the B20 beamline at HZB. I'm super impressed. Uh, then, of course, we have our visualization and processing software. As many of you already know, uh, Mantid is one of uh, Mantid is the instrument so the reduction software used at ISIS, um, and of course, we will hopefully be continuing to use this um, of the facility. Sorry, um, but we're also in the process of developing another software, Skip. So this is a, another platform using Python to based on Python rubber to reduce uh, the kind of the the large data arrays that will come from, for example, the Loki detectors. Uh, this runs currently on Jupyter Notebook. Uh, it's got the huge benefit of being quite a bit faster than Mantid, but obviously it's uh, ground up that works. So there's a bit of work to be done there. And of course, we're uh, using the, the similar data analysis tool that I think most people who've done SANS uh, will know and love, such as SASU, and continuing to collaborate to those type of projects. So, as I said, uh, run short on time here. So uh, the, we've kind of the world and aware of the project. Here's some pretty pictures of the construction so far. Draw attention to the collimation tank because it's giant and it's a vaguely impressive piece of kit. Uh, or my favorite area, which is the detectors array. Again, I think it's just because it's huge. For example, this detector tank is about 3.5 meters wide. Uh, it's a giant. You can clearly see that there's a lot of work really underway where hoping to start installation uh, middle of next year. So we're making like, good progress. So finally, just to finish up, once we have Loki, uh, in a few years time, once we're done with the commissioning, uh, what do we hope to do with it? So uh, here's some examples of what we might look for for the early science. So of course, we want to take advantage of our wide Q range, our sample area, our low background work with our collaborators and experts to investigate systems that have multiple length scales, perform experiments that use flow, 
that can take advantage of this simultaneous curing, such as rheology, microfluidics. Of course, we'll be carrying out the workhorse sans experiment, but hopefully with the higher flux, we can work with a higher throughput. And of course, taking advantage of the pre-commissioned in situ sample environments. Some examples I've shown here in previous work, uh, for example, Rachel Evans group in Cambridge, where they use photo switchable um, worm light my cells, uh, working at multiple different light sales and kind of in situ setups. Polymeric microgels, where they work at, look at systems under flow, or for example, these uh, biocyclic uh, fluorescent peptides, again, multiple length scales in situ spectroscopies, and this has the potential to involve the ESS DMAX facility, which is our duration facility that works in house and is already up and running. So I am over time. So I'll just quickly show you the final uh, summary slide. Again, uh, I think I've iterated it enough what we hope to benefit and the gains we hope to get from Loki. Uh, just to finish up that the installation should begin beginning next year with Beam of Target the year after, and hopefully we should be starting our user operation 2023, 2024. That just leaves me to thank the Loki team, uh, which is massive. So I got right down to writing the list of contributors for ISIS, and then, uh, yeah, it got hard after that. Um, but yeah, there's many people to thank, and this is a huge project. Well, thank you very much again for listening. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, have a nice weekend.